lot of us think we're not using that much water in our landscapes, but if you actually measured what's coming out of your system, you'd find out it's more than you think. And then of course there is the amount of fertilizer and then fungicides and pesticides and all the other things that have an environmental impact. Most of these plants that I will show you, quite a few of them, don't need any of that. They don't need that much water, they probably don't need much fertilization, and they certainly don't need the fungicides and the herbicides on top. And more and more people are asking for these kinds of things in their, in their landscape designs. They are saying, where can we put them? It may be driven by the mid-century modern thing, you know, we want a little bit more of negative space, we'll look at some of those. Uh, removing entire lawn, you may want to talk to your HOA. They, they may say, yes. And I do understand, I don't, I've never have to dealt with one before, but I, a lot of HOAs will say that you need a certain percentage of permeable landscape uh, within your design. So it may be impacted by what you choose. Usually though, it's going to be a combination of these things, kind of what you saw a second ago, hardscape, softscape, all these things together and some ground cover plants, that's going to be the solution. So it shouldn't be an afterthought. No, I want you to think of it integrated. I'll give you some reasons why to think, you think shrubs and trees, you should think ground covers too at the same time. So I wanted to define a ground cover for you because for us at North Haven, when we think of ground covers, we're thinking of plants, right? A ground cover is a plant. It doesn't have to be a plant. It can also be hardscaping. But mostly it's these kinds of plants that just really grow horizontally in one way or another, or they reseed out, or they propagate themselves in such a way that they end up going horizontally, and you get more. And mulches and paths, another thing is going to certainly be a choice as well. But if you're doing a lawn or ground cover, this is the important one. This is what you need to look at for those of you who are battling this. If we're out in Allen and these other cities, I'm not so sure it's the same as where we are in North Dallas, where we typically have a 1960s, 1970s era ranch style home and two live oak trees in the front yard. There's a few little nods and a few little chuckles, so there's probably used to that. And there's the point, right, where you say, those live oak trees are our landscape value, we can't prune them anymore, and the grass is going, bah, doesn't like it anymore. It's usually San Augustine, it's one of the best choices. It's one of the best choices for part sun. I'm not so sure I'd say shade, but four. Where is my laser pointer? Four hours. And you need to quantify that. Or if you're just seeing that the grass isn't really doing well, it couldn't be you necessarily. Maybe not. Maybe it's not the watering and all that stuff. Maybe it's just too little sun. How much traffic is it going to have on it? Some of these ground covers can handle some varying amounts of traffic and some can. If you have a lot of two-year-olds and you have a St. Bernard, it may be a little difficult to keep something established. Pick the right one that you've got. How many types? How many types would you want? Do y'all know this one? In sustainable landscaping, you really don't want a monoculture. All lawns, as we define them now, this is my new phrase, as we define lawns now, is usually one plant. A lot of us have Bermuda and St. Augustine put together. But Different kinds of plants put together is diversity. Diversity is what makes this entire planet work, no matter what aspect you're looking at, and you need a diversity. You need different kinds of things working together. It will make your maintenance easier, I guarantee you. How much maintenance? This is the question that we all have to ask ourselves. How much maintenance? Are you doing it? Are you having a landscape service come out and do it? How much do you want to pay for, to do the labor for, to do the maintenance for? For it. Okay, will it work? Yes. So those different types of ground covers, we start looking at them. The habit of them is the major thing that I want you to know. So not all of them are going to be vining. Asian jasmine, we do know that one, and these kinds of plants that will have what we call a stolen or runner. This is the typical kind of thing you're used to, right? Asian jasmine in a lot of places, and for a good reason, it's a great plant. There's those. Creeping Jenny is another one. Upright ones. You'll see a lot of upright things and a lot of different kinds of perennials that could be your choice as well. It doesn't put out runners of some kind, but it still could be a good choice. Clumping things. Y'all are used to mondos, liriopes, things that are called monkey grass, right? They grow in little clumps. But these are the ones that are rhizomatous. These are the ones that have 
little runners underneath the soil and they go that way and spread, but it grows as a clump. And sedges, hopefully we'll talk a little bit more about sedges. And sedges are terrific, not grass, but clumping choices. Already you have some diversity, see that? Very cool. And then stoloniferous, as we mentioned there a second ago. And then lamb's ear and frog fruit and some of these other very cool different kinds of plants might be choices for you too. So these are what the next slides are gonna look like for you on the ones that I've broken down that we have time for. We could chat until about six o'clock if I wanted us to, but I've broken down just a few of them for you. Is it native or not? Well, I can tell you that overall, a native is probably gonna be your best choice, but not all these are, a lot of these are adapted. Whether it's an annual or perennial, right here, whether it's an evergreen or not, or type of perennial that might be evergreen, the light, the moisture, I tried to put some notes in here for you about the kind of soil under moisture. Is it gonna be a lawn alternative or not? We're not focusing quite so much on lawn turners as we are on ground covers. The traffic, will it, will it tolerate in traffic tolerance? Whether it spreads or not, we kind of said how that works. The benefits of it, a lot of these things will bloom too. It's not just a green cover. You might get you some flowers as well. Yeah, can you mow it? Some of these you will probably want to mow but the amount of mowing is much, much less than a lawn. Wildlife value. I'm all about some wildlife value. Anybody into wildscaping like me? If you want to no, she says. Well, we're going to have to convert her. So there are ways with ground covers to bring in some more wildlife to the garden if you're interested in that. The maintenance amount, the biggie, and then availability. I can do a whole seminar to teach all of us is that plant going to be seasonally available when you come to North Haven Gardens or you go to Shades of Green or one of the nurseries and you say, I'm looking for some Mondo. And they'll say, I don't carry that this time of year. That's a different thing. Standard ground covers. These are the terms that we use at North Haven. And we break them down in terms of standard, the ones that you've seen, like Asian Jasmine, and then specialty ones. Ones that are, uh, they're priced differently, which is the major reason why we do this but they're the ones that will give you a little bit more diversity than these standards. Asian jasmine, you know, trichonospermum, I do have the botanicals in here. You don't have to learn them. Different cultivars exist at Asian jasmine. You'll see some with some uh, creams and other kinds of colors, which are very cool. But the green one is the one you usually see. Liriope, Liriope in the south, it's everywhere, which is a good thing. The one that's right here, I'm gonna run you through some of these varieties. Spicata, I wish my, is it working? There it is. Spicata is a very narrow leafed version, almost this narrow, but it stays this narrow. And it's what most of the others were bred from. No one is selling it. We don't want you to buy them because it spreads like wildflower. Whee! But the ones they bred from are the ones you're looking for, like Big Blue. This is technically Big Blue, it's just a baby. It hasn't grown much. The variegated, one of my favorites, giant, it gets a grass look to it, terrific. Silver dragon, I have silver dragon right here. And some others, Mondo. Mondo, I know that Neil Sperry uh, talks about how much this is his favorite, and it's one of mine too. I grew up with this down in San Antonio. This is one of the toughest, nicest little ground covers you can get in the Mondos. We grew up calling this monkey grass, not the ripe. But this one is smaller, uh, nice, finer texture, and tough, 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 tough. There's a black one, there's the dwarf one. I know the, the dwarf one, pretty much everywhere too. And there's some new ones. But we'll tour you through some of these. So this will give you some of the basics of each one. And what I've done for you in this handout is given you all the plant lists. So you have copies of the plant lists themselves and not these slides. You want to take notes, you've got space for notes. But Asian jasmine, as we said, is tough. That's the reason it's in a lot of places. Don't worry about it taking over. I don't think it's going to. But this is a great plant. This is a nice shot because you can see very much out. That looks like Park Cities to me. This is something that you're going to see very much in a lawn replacement that none of that has grass at all, but it can be mowed and it can be kept very neatly on the edges if someone knows what they're doing when they're using a string trimmer, it's quite possible. Look how neat it looks. And then you're getting some of the other detail here.
to see how the runners look, which you can see here in real life. And then these beautiful, shiny, dark green leaves most of the year, which is great. Where's the caveat? The caveat here is that it can get too cold for it. There's a point. Haven't had it quite yet this year. February is our coldest month. We'll see what happens. But every once in a while, the tops, especially on an established stand of Asian jasmine, the tops will go kind of brown on you. And unless it's really severe, which I doubt, in the 20s, you know, below 20s, you can just cut that upper part off and it will come right on back, which is good. Liriope. I like Liriope quite a bit. It's amazing how popular it is in America. I did some more research. It's not just us in the South. It's in a lot of America. And again, it's a great plant. Um, Spicato, you're not going to see, as I said. You will see some of these other varieties. This one up here, and you can see how it's combined with uh, stones and Japanese maples in a very naturalistic setting and some other ground covers. And do you see a long stripe of it? Nope. It doesn't have to go up your sidewalk. Does it go up your sidewalk? Well, it used to go up mine, so I'll say, yes, it used to go up my sidewalk. And it looked great. It softened the edges. But what if you took a ground cover like this and just did clumps of it instead of grass? You can't grow grass in shade. We already said that. There's one exception, really. But you can do these and treat it as a grass. Here's my favorite, variegated liriope. And this is a nice, beautiful shot of this one because it really blooms beautifully. This nice purple little stems in late summer, early fall. Great in containers. A lot of these plants are great in containers. I'll tell you, I didn't put a lot of photos of containers for these, but I'll try to help you with that. And then silver dragon down here in the bottom, which you're seeing here. And the other thing people will say, this is variegated. And they'll say, it doesn't look very good. And I guess it doesn't. This is what I call seasonal affective disorder. They're sad. Ah, <laughs> oh, y'all woke up. So they do this. They'll look very flat. I have lots of variegated variety like this in containers, and they do exactly this. You know what it means? It means if I'm established, this is not established, it's a baby, it's going to go off to the side like so, and then the new growth will be exposed right here, and you can see it. If you wait too long to do your cutback, you're going to cut all of that new growth, and you don't want to do that, right? So if you've ever cut back liriopes, and mondos for that matter, this is the time of year. Valentine's Day is the time of year. Instead of just thinking about chocolate and going out to dinner and having champagne, you should be thinking cutting back your perennials. <laughs> I know, you should. And do a little cut like that. And it's very easy to do. Most of these is a general rule, because I know everyone loves general rules, three to five years or more for a ground cover to be established before you start running mowers and doing things like that. If you do mowers or something you know, earlier on, it may just start pulling your plants out. That's not very good. But you can cut it back. Do you have to do it all the time? No, I actually don't. Sometimes I just wait and see if it gets really cold in February and it makes it turn kind of brown. If it doesn't and it stays kind of green, the plant still looks good, I'll let it go. Go back in and watch the game. Not a big deal. Mondo. Mondo's terrific. I love it a lot. I did some landscape maintenance years ago for a home in the center of Dallas and they, they had zero lot line houses, so there really wasn't much there. But um, leading to uh, um, access way, an alley kind of thing, there was no lawn whatsoever, but very steep banks. And they took large white stone boulders there, and it dropped pretty precipitously. And then the mondo was just there, growing just like a grass all through it. And it looked terrific. It was wonderful. Zero maintenance. Really zero. You can't get a mower to it. I mean, you could cut it back by hand if you needed to. But it works very, very well. Specialty ground covers. That's really a lot of this group right here. We're going to focus mostly on these today because I think you all know those major three, or you should. And they're good choices. But what if we got you some diversity and we talked about some of these other newer ones? This is a list, and again, I've copied that for you with some. We're not going to go over all the botanicals. There's no test on the Latin or the Greek. So y'all can can rest. A juga. A juga. Gail was saying this is one of her favorites. Um, I like a juga a lot. I can tell you that um, I kind of sort of feel like Howard Garrett and some of the others who have said it needs to be in the right spot to do really, really well. It's not consistent like Asian jasmine is all the time. It's sometimes it's inconsistent. But if you don't mind watering, notice the moist. 
Notice the moist up there. It does like some moisture. It's not very drought tolerant at all. But you get really some stunning leaf effects, some colors. You can see the beautiful flowers that remind you of a little blue bonnet there. Of course, that's close up. It's, you know, about two inches or so high. Different scallops of the leaves that are pretty. Um, this is probably bronze beauty that's right here, and some of these pinker ones. There are some, like a lot of plants, the neojugas and the others that have been crossbred a lot, and you get different kinds of colors going in them. They're weaker, just a little bit. They don't grow quite as vigorously for you, or they may freeze from time to time more than a plain one, like this bronze beauty. It's a terrific plant. I had one client years ago, and she lived in Park Cities, and she had a backyard, and she had a juga. That was her backyard, and it was very, very pretty. There's a point where it can freeze down all the way, and then, but it will come back. Ardesia. Uh, I like Ardesia quite a bit. This is one of those Japanese ones. Notice the japonica means from Japan. And these kinds of plants come from nice mountainous regions that stay cool. We don't stay cool, do we? And we have reflected heat. These kinds of plants, and you see japonica every once in a while, you're talking about these kinds that need to be probably in the north or northeast sides and stay cooler. No reflected heat, but they do beautifully. Look how gorgeous they are. You get these really nice berries on them. Sometimes a little bit of both. This is one of my favorites. This is the variegated version, which is quite nice. Neat, huh? There is a ground cover for everyone. Absolutely. Here's one that gets a lot of attention, creeping fig. It is a fig, believe it or not. No fig newtons, sorry. But this particular one is a very low growing one and people like to use it a lot and they'll say, we have a courtyard, we'll have something like this with that white wall that they wanna grow it on. It will grow up almost anything. And then February 14th, Valentine's Day, whatever, we have an ice event and it's nice and really, really cold. And then what happens on this ficus is that it will start freezing back in sections on the wall. And you've got brown here and brown there. If you're okay with that, then take off. It'd be nice. But now you can see where I put here. That's the reason it says maintenance. Medium to high. It's not a low maintenance plant, that's for sure. But it does great effects. Uh, it gives you that English, the Tudor Revival kind of look on a home if you let it climb the brick or something, especially if you don't want English ivy. But this gives you something a little bit finer textured, which is nice. I love using this. I thought y'all get a kick out of it. The spread is indefinite. Unless it gets really cold. Then it gets shoved back. Here's Creeping Jenny. This is one that's been capturing kind of a lot of attention um, these days and gets um, very popular using containers. I love this example because of that cobalt blue with this contrast. Uh, if you haven't been to the Arboretum during the winter, you should go. I was there yesterday in the Dallas Arboretum. And a lot of their colorways, they were using this bright acidy green with dark purple, rich purple. And it was a very, very pleasing contrast. It was mustard, the, the bright yellow green was mustard and the other purple was another kind of mustard actually, which is very, very nice. It does like moisture. Um, the, the one time I saw this doing really well in one of my houses that I maintained was underneath a purple Japanese maple. So it was very attractive to see the purple maple and then that yellow green underneath it. It does spread very, very nicely. It will freeze back most of the way. Sometimes it doesn't go all the way to the ground, but um, I have some in containers and they've already frozen back to the ground. Just trim that and boing, comes right back. And it is available most of the year, as I say. Neat plant. English ivy, good old toxic English ivy. Yes, it is slightly toxic but it doesn't stop us from planting it. Um, it's probably one of those plants that was brought here along with all of that English looking lawn idea. And it looks very English and looks good. And it's a good choice in a lot of ways. Absolutely, and you'll see it a lot. Notice this though, very well drained. A lot of people come up to me and they'll show me these beautiful leaves. This is one of the variegated versions. This is probably gold child. Gold Child is a very, very pretty miniature version. But they get these lesions on it, it's looking brown. And so what's going on with the English ivy? Because it doesn't look very good. And it's drainage. It's all about drainage. They're prone to several types of fungal diseases if water sits on them for a long time. Soil prep, and we're gonna talk soil prep at the end. 
will help you a whole bunch. But if you want to use English Ivy more often, I don't have very, in fact, I didn't have a choice today. There are, this is the plain old English Ivy, but these miniature ones like the needle point on the top and then that gold child there, they're smaller leaves. And I like them because I use them in containers. And you've heard of thriller, filler, spiller in containers. I call these trailers. And this gives you something that comes out of a, a container and looks good because the scale's small. This is big. In one of my other presentations, I think it's my shade presentation, I have a picture of the house that I used to have. I have a beautiful, gorgeous background of English ivy in my backyard. And it came from the neighbor's yard, went up over the privacy fence and covered the fence and came down into my yard. Uh-huh. Frog fruit. I wish I had a sample for you today. We don't happen to have it in. This is one of my favorites. I just think the name is great, number one. But this is a true Texas native, and it's fantastic. Oh, we'll say this right now. One person's invasive plant is another person's great ground cover. I need a t-shirt with that. It's true. So you're going to think about all these plants and think about, number one, how much maintenance and choosing the right plant but also be thinking about, are you gonna control it? Is it the right plant? This one is growing in the cracks of my driveway. I joked, I said I was gonna do a COD class, the crack of the driveway plants. This'll do it. I've seen it over at uh, SMU, planted in the hell strip, you know, between the sidewalk and the street. Awful, awful place. I'm sure SMU was getting tired of mowing it all the time. They filled some of them with frog fruit. Mowable? Native, brings butterflies, it's a larval source and a nectar source. It takes hardly any water, it grows in sun, it grows in shade, and everything in between. What more could you ask? And it's cool. There's a bee coming to it. I see honeybees coming to mind mostly. Um, I want to show you the laser there. But these flowers, and you can see the bee, the flowers are teeny tiny, and they're little groups of them, a little cone, like a cylinder. It's very, very neat. Can you tell I love it? That's a great plant. And then horse herb. Frog fruit and horse herb. You can grow them together. It's a terrific plant. This is one that you'll see a lot of people saying, there's this weed in my yard. I want to get rid of it. What is it? It's horse herb. <laughs> and it's very adapted. It's more adapted because it's native to this area than the St. Augustine, which is from, what, North Africa, I think? So this is a terrific plant. Here's your, a close-up of it. Straggler daisy is the common name, which I don't like. I like horse herb, so I called it that. Tiny yellow flowers. It's another larval and nectar source. Um, and like most ground covers, we talked about wildscaping, most ground covers offer shelter at the very least for little animals, lizards, um, frogs, and toads. Not so much frogs in our area, um, but they're great to have this kind of thing. The only thing is, on horse herb, you can't really use it as a lawn because it's going to freeze down the first couple of years for sure. Um, unless you have any kind of protected area, it's going to freeze back like a perennial and you won't see much on top. And what I do with mine, I have a backyard area of it, it's great. I just mow that off, which I'm getting ready to do. Comes right back. Oh, also, bonus, I should put on here, it seeds out very well. When I moved to the house, I'd tell you how I got some. I probably got some from a plant I bought at work, but when I moved to the house, there was one or two of them. I made sure I mowed it and kept the area just a little bit bare, and now I have big areas of horse herb covering it. Keeps the mud down, works great. Terrific plant. Lamium, I know y'all have seen Lamium. This is spotted dead nettle, which is another kind of very English sounding crappy name. Just call it Lamium or false nettle. Have you ever touched a nettle before? Oh, Lauren says yes. Y'all have time for another story? I went past the back part of our greenhouse the other day and I was getting ready for a class and I had a cart and I was in a hurry because I'm always in a hurry and I got lots of stuff going on. And there's this beautiful container and it had a red yucca in it. And it had this one little plant sitting there, it was a weed. A weed is a plant out of place. I thought, I'm going to pull that thing and get back to what I need to do. And I pulled on it because I thought it was lemon balm. Looks just like it. It wasn't. It was stinging nettle, which is what this plant looks very much like. And for about three days, it was really, really stinging. Anyway, isn't that great trivia? Y'all going to go home and say, guess what I learned today? 
but they can really, really hurt. These don't hurt at all. They're really, really beautiful. Uh, mostly what you see, I chose that photo for you, is one that really is pretty variegated with this cream, um, not so much cream, almost really silver. Very pretty silver purple flowers on top of that. Here you can see it paired with, I believe, a stilby and hostas, probably not from Dallas or Texas, maybe from up north, but it's a great plant. Again, make sure you're checking the right plant, right place. This is moist and probably in cooler shade. Remember, you can have hot, dry shade and you can have cool, moist shade. Two totally different things. Lysimachia. I did bring one. Lysimachia, I think, is going to be up and coming for us, mostly because you get these really showy flowers. Unlike the frog fruit, which has teeny tiny flowers, this time you really get something that's beautiful with these yellow flowers. It's nice, bright, sunny yellow and a little bit of red, orangey throats to them, which is quite terrific. And here's one here. It hasn't bloomed yet. We're just starting to get them in. It's got a little roughness going on, but it's an awkward teenager. It's going to grow. But again, notice this color. This, you're, you're sure you've seen this in azaleas and uh, abelias and other plants. This yellowy green really sings in the landscape, especially in pots. We use them in pots a lot, very true. Pachysandra. Pachysandra is probably overblown, I would say. Another Japanese plant. Um, this one really would like to have cool shade. But, however, if you're growing azaleas, if you're growing hostas, if you're growing the uhs, hydrangeas, camellias, you know, the acid-loving plants, this is probably a good little ground cover for you. Probably the north, northeast side um, has this very nice symmetrical looking foliage and very good. Um, I wouldn't invest a lot of my time in it unless you really had the best spot in it. That's why I put it in here so you have people recommending something crazy to you. Pigeonberry, another native. Y'all know this one? It's a great plant. I like it a lot. You get this combination of the pink flowers that look like foam and then the berries you can see there, usually both. And it really does bring birds, so it's true to its name, which is a good thing. This one really doesn't spread by any kind of, of runners or anything underneath the ground. You usually see it doing by seed. Uh, when I first moved to Dallas, it was in my backyard in part shade, a lot of shade. And when it's in more shade, it tends to be shorter. It was looking beautiful in early spring. Flowers, berries, uh, maybe a few honeybees coming to it every once in a while. Neat plant. Purple winter creeper. I know you've seen this. A lot of cities, I'm not so sure Alan's got some out here. I didn't see any on the way in. But a lot of cities are using this in those very difficult areas, like along the freeway, in planters, or something that they can't get to or don't want to get to very often. And this is the winter color, purple winter creeper. <laughs> it has a really nice, good, common name. It's a type of euonymus, just like the shrub. I get you a little bit of that bronze coloration up there. It turns this purple in winter, and then when it gets nice and warm and stays warm, above 45 degrees or so, it turns bright green again and then shifts back and goes back and forth. Uh, another Neil Sperry favorite. I like to keep track of which ones that he likes and why, because I think it's kind of nice. And this is a great plant. Super, super, super low maintenance. Are you all the low maintenance type? See, the high maintenance people don't want to raise their hands. So. But it's a great one for that. And those odd places. Vinca, Vinca major and Vinca minor. Easy to remember. Major is bigger and minor is smaller. But this is a plant, be sure you want it. You know what Vinca means? The conqueror. Uh huh. And it will do so. It does have its bad points, other than that. That may be a good point for you. The bad point is, is that sometimes in late summer, it really starts shutting down a little bit, doesn't like the heat, and it gets a little leaf roller, a little caterpillar that goes in there and starts rolling the leaves, and the leaves turn brown that they've rolled. And it doesn't look so good. But it's periwinkle. I gave you a close-up of the flower. It has that, that purpley flower color. It's very, very pretty. Super, super low maintenance. You could probably use it as a lawn alternative, which is what I put. And then it spreads everywhere. Be sure you want it. And it will go dormant. Sometimes, I put evergreen as being semi here. Um, it will go dormant from time to time. Here's another favorite, woolly stomodia. Can you tell I like the natives? 
Woolly stomodia needs to be used more. This is terrific. Just like these yellow green plants, really, you can see how they just stand out. Silvers look great in the landscape. Those into the mid century modern and anything that looks great with those kinds of styles, you're talking something that looks great with succulents, and that silver is very, very pretty. And you can see how it comes over a wall here, it looks great. We have it just like this at North Haven, actually, I do believe. Here it is with probably whale's tongue agave, very cool. And you can't see it because it washes out a little bit, but they have very, very pale lavender kind of flowers that's tucked in there. But look at moisture and look at the soil. Dry and sandy. You can imagine this kind of plant coming over a sand dune at the beach, right? It has that kind of feel. That's where it's from. It's adaptable. It looks very nice in a container if you wanted to do it. But combine it with succulents, it's really, really nice. And it has a woolly texture. Perennials as ground covers. This is something I wanted you to know about because there are so many choices. This is just really some of them. I kind of separated most of them that's here. These are some of the choices. And I want to run through a few of them for you so you kind of have someone that will, will stick with you for a while. Acorus I did bring, or a chorus. And people will, will ask me you know, if it's a kind of grass, and it's not a grass. Um, this is actually a water plant, or what we call a marginal, which grows in the edges of marshes and low-lying areas. Uh, it's a good rain garden plant for that purpose. Um, I've got it in several areas for me. I grow it in water, in a pond, and it, it's also good in uh, areas just near water. We have some planted near one of our ponds at North Haven in a rock area, and looks very attractive. Uh, and again, you can cut it back a little bit at the top, from time to time, but this yellowy green color looks terrific. It's a nice plant to be looking for, especially if you want something different. It's like a cross between an iris and a grass. Does that make sense in the way it grows? Very funky. Bearded irises. I can probably put bearded irises in every one of my presentations at some point. A great sun perennial, a, a great texture plant, wonderful thing. Bearded irises, don't forget, they're a great ground cover, absolutely. Blackfoot daisy. These plants you'll see a little bit later. Blackfoot daisy just turned into the all-star for Texas natives about 15, 20 years ago. And it's really getting out there a lot more because you're, you or other people are asking for it. And they say, we want more of it. And the growers are responding, which is good, and getting it. Blackfoot daisy has those beautiful little white nickel-sized flowers. It smells like honey in the sun. It smells really good. Trails over walls. Looks terrific. Sedges. Gail and I were talking about sedges, and I think you're going to see and hear a lot more about where we are with sedges, mostly because people keep saying, I want to grow some grass in shade, and you already know you're not going to be doing that. But look what you get, though. You get the grass texture. You get the look. How do you tell? Sedges have edges. You stick your hand in, and you go, wow, it's a little sharp in there somewhat. It's not going to hurt you or anything, but it doesn't feel soft like a grass. So you know it's a sedge. What does it mean to you? It means lower maintenance, number one. But it also means a lot of versatility when it comes to positioning it. So most of these sedges will grow in shade to part shade. They'll take more sun, generally, if you give them more water. So if you want to water a little bit more and put it on the southwest side, reflected heat from a driveway, a porch, a patio, a sidewalk, maybe you can do it. But they're very versatile. Don't worry about it. You will see green, dark green. You'll see brown tan and all these cool effects in them. This very gold look. There's ever gold, ever sheen. Lots of very cool names. And I really think that we're poised on the edge to see more and more of these characters planted. And you'll like it a lot. Cat mint, not cat nip, cat mint, which is a different plant. Walker's low is what you usually see, this very low growing one. Coral berry, another Texas native. It's a little thicket forming plant. It's good for you. Remember, this one's going to go this way quite a bit. It may be too much for you. And also taller. Ground covers don't have to be six inches. These are taller plants. Dwarf umbrella plant. I wish I could show you my picture of it. I didn't have room to get all of these in there. But dwarf umbrella plant is down at the Texas Discovery Gardens. And they probably planted one or two of them. And it's doing large, great big areas. And only grows this big. 
You've seen umbrella plant, I'm sure, in ponds and those kinds of areas. This is a plant that's the dwarf version and shorter and mowable, which is very good. Dichondra, Dichondra is probably one of the most common lawn weeds that there is. And it comes in a green version, which is usually what you see in your lawn as a weed. And then it comes in this silver version. You should probably seek this one out, especially in a container. Very, very cool. Four nerve daisy, I have her right here. I even found a flower. Love little four nerve daisies. You can see how nice and neat that it is. Makes little mounds, looks great in a rock garden. Not so much on bringing any kind of pollinators or insects, which is weird for a Texas native. But these nice wiry stems and beautiful yellow gold flowers are terrific. Good, well-draining soil, you will like it. It stays right where you put it, which is nice. Golden ground soil you'll hardly ever see. Availability is gonna be kinda iffy at best. Very, very neat. It's actually native to this area. Think of it as a very attractive dandelion that grows in late winter, early spring and blooms for you. Hardy plumbago is the one that a lot of people ask for because it looks just like that tropical plumbago, excuse me, with the blue flowers. But this one will freeze to the ground and come right back, which is terrific. Horsetail reed, I'm sure you know, it's gotten really popular in modern styles, Asian style gardens, and you can trim it. It's wonderful. Inland sea oats, this is the Texas native grass that grows in shade, but it's not a turf grass. It's going to be an ornamental grass that's going to get about two to two and a half feet high, and it's a terrific choice. Lamb's ear, I bet you know, with that silver color. Lamb's ear is a terrific land cover, for sure. It will cover large areas if you let it do it. It doesn't like poor drainage, that's the big one. And then lyre leaf sage is on there, which is a nice salvia that you might like, and blooms in late winter, early spring. You will find, not so sure why, just thinking about this, a lot of these ground covers tend to bloom in late winter, early spring, these little low things like this. So when you're looking for variety in your landscape, especially for wildscaping, choose plants that bloom at different times, and you'll do better. Mexican petunia, I know you know, and I did bring one. Speaking of the crack of the driveway plant, there's also another class I was going to do called alley plants because it was growing in my alley in Austin when I lived in Austin. This is a terrific plant and people will say, be careful, you're going to get more of it because it seeds out like crazy, but it covers large areas and does very well for you. Um, there's two, one standard, which gets to be that one you've seen with the three, two and a half, three feet high, pink flowers, looks like a petunia, but it's not. And then there's Katie's. Katie has a little short one, and she gets about 12 inches high. And it's terrific. Look for Katie. Miss Flower, if you are into butterflies, you need it. Uh, you're going to have to go get it. And it has nice, tufty little blooms, and it will have butterflies on it, mostly monarchs and some queens. It's a ground cover. People will buy it for their wildflower garden or maybe for their butterfly garden, and I have to warn them. It's not going to stay in this little pot. That's going to go that way. It's a ground cover. Oxalis, y'all have seen the little clover-looking plants, like a four-leaf clover. Oxalis is terrific, especially in purple. Um, pink <coughs> bubble. I'm going to bring a pink bubble over here. It's a strange name, and you never see pink bubble as a name. Um, but this is it. This persicaria is a very, a very attractive plant. Again, these kinds of plants you know, from uh, cooler areas don't invest in large numbers of them. Probably put them in a container. Pink skullcap, another Texas native. It's been everywhere. Santalinas, you probably know. Uh, and green, and also sulfur. Sedums, sedums for sure. I know that you're hearing more about sedum. People will come in and say, looking for sedum. They, they toss out the Latin name and they're ready to go. Here's just two of them, the dragon's blood. This is reflexum. This one, I'm, the name's escaping me at the moment, but again, we've got the yellow-green color. And again, being succulents, easy to grow, well-drained soil, not as much hot direct sun as you would think, but they grow in lots of areas, and it's a good plant to mix. This reflects them like so. It's spreading in various areas in my garden. A little piece breaks off and it gets over here because the dog moved it. It's rooting over here. Fully evergreen. It was, what, 12, 14 degrees? What was our last that really, really cold couple nights we had this past winter? Didn't do anything. Didn't phase it. 
and it was fine. This is a sedum reflexum, like reflexum. your reflexes, yes. Very, very terrific. They're all different, so make sure you get the right sedum you're looking for. Um, snake herb, I want to show that one to you one of these days. We'll show that more often. I think it should be seen. Uh, it's another Texas native and grows underneath the ground. It has nice little flowers on it and does very, very well. Spider warts. Um, kind of wild look on spider warts. Be careful, you want a wild kind of look to the landscape. The HOA or the neighbor may say, what's that? Uh, strawberry geraniums, a lot of people ask for it. Like, um, it's a very classic plant. It looks like a strawberry crossed with a geranium uh, and is a nice ground cover. And then purple heart. We were chatting earlier and yes, this is the plant that I grew up calling wandering Jew. And the Jewish Community Center next door doesn't mind. We say we have Wandering Jew. They say, yeah, we call that Wandering Jew. Uh, Purple Heart is the more common name you see, so it's a little bit uh, more sensitive, possibly. Uh, this is another plant that Neil Sperry is crazy about. And he's mentioned it in several different kinds of ways for taking reflective heat, being a good ground cover, being a nice color. This is a really wonderful plant. Comes in this dark purple gets a little bit more purple in full sun. I've seen it in driveways and parking lots in full sun, and I've seen it in just about total shade, as much as you can get. And it will seed out. It'll, it'll do crack of the driveway, which is great. I like it a lot. Verbenas, be careful on verbena. People will say, I'm looking for homestead purple verbena. Fine, just remember this verbena and some of the others are short-lived plants. They don't live that long. There are short-lived perennials. You ever heard of that? They don't grow so long and keep going for you. So be careful which verbena you get. Tenuous secta is the most common one. It's a nice plant and does well. Violets, those are true violets. That's the Texas native violet that grows. It's the relative of pansies. It's the one that has smaller flowers. It looks just like a pansy. It's a great plant. Wavy cloak, I did bring. We were talking about wavy cloak fern. This is another one that's great. This is one of those anomalies when it comes to ferns because it's xerophytic, which means it actually likes dry locations, unlike most ferns. And it has this brown coloration on the bottom. It's not dying. It's actually brown on top and silvery green on top. Uh, very, very nice plant. Looks great in rock gardens. Slowly spreads, not a fast spreader, but terrific. And then Zexmenia. Zexmenia is the name that you'll see most of the time now. This is another great plant. I write it down, put a star next to it. This is a plant that if you want it to seed out and you let it seed out, you'll have plenty of it and it's terrific. It flowers nearly nine months of the year with yellow flowers and brings insects and pollinators better than anything else in my garden and I love it. I like free plants. You like free plants? Let it seed out. It's terrific. Had to put in some annuals. Got to have a few annuals. Now, blue bonnets is a great ground cover. Pretty. Texas State flower. And no, it's not illegal to pick them. <laughs> Y'all heard that? Um, it's a great plant. It's a nice plant. You'll start seeing them coming up now. I think I have a couple coming up in my yard. Oh, I'm ready to do its thing. Just remember, it's going to look like crapola when it gets to be about late July, August or so, because it's going to seed. That's what it's going to do its thing. So you can't do your whole front yard in them, but put you know, a few spots of them, let them go to seed, let it scatter some more seed, and let it come on back. Here's one that I'm really liking a lot more, and that's scarlet sage. This is another true salvia. This is sage like your kitchen, just not the exact same one. It's a true salvia. It has these terrific red flowers, and what does it bring? What? Hummingbirds. Hummingbirds, yes. We'll get y'all going here in a second. Salvia coccinia, coccinia means red, which is wonderful. And this salvia you'll see bred in all different kinds of other cultivars. Have we used that yet? Cultivars, cultivated varieties. Lady in red is one of the names. And it will get probably a little bit shorter. They always want to breed things to make them shorter, more easily managed in the landscape. I've had mine seed out here and there. This is just the regular old salvia coccinia. In fact, I didn't buy it. It came from a plant at North Haven that I bought and went boing and popped up. And in late July and August, it was looking like this, flowers, and it's great. 
And it's nice too because that's when the hummingbirds are coming through in their fall migration. And it's going to have this beautiful red coloration. Then there's trailing lantana. This is one of my favorites. And I say annual because we market or sell those lantana as an annual. So you can get you a little small one for a couple of dollars. And it typically, as you probably know, like a lot of lantanas, it ends up being a true perennial and you keep it. However, Rusty's opinion now, they call it trailing. I can show you pictures of mine and the plant is not trailing, it's up here. <laughs> and it's reaching out. We were talking a moment ago about where we are exactly right now with our weather, it's been so bizarre. It hasn't frozen that much in a lot of our landscapes. And in mine, it's still blooming. It has little edges of it in that lavender color and it's blooming. So don't expect it to be really low like sedums or some of these others, but it's terrific. And of course, it brings butterflies very well. Anyone interested in butterflies wants lantana. And then some herbs. I had to put some herbs in. Y'all should know Monarda, which is a type of mint, which is bee balm. Thymes. I put my thymes. Never enough time, right? You got to have more time. I thought I got some, some additional ones. This is the pink shints, which does have little pink blooms on them. There's many kinds of thyme. Make sure you pick the right one that you would like. A variety of thymes would be a terrific ground cover, especially around your herb garden or your vegetable garden. Go-to cola is actually another good herb. You don't see it very often for shade. Hoja Santa is a terrific plant with big heart-shaped leaves. Uh, another herb used in cooking. Tall, though, in Houston, where it hardly ever freezes, I've seen it eight and nine feet. But it grows by rhizomes very strongly underneath the ground. Has this root beer sassafras kind of flavor. It's very, very neat. Um, lemon balm, we did mention a moment ago. And again, if you don't mind it seeding out, let it bloom, let it seed, and you'll have it in a lot of places. However, in the areas where I have it in my herb garden, I don't water that much. And I also mulch very heavily. And it doesn't cause me a problem. So it depends. Mints. Yep, I know. Right plant, right place. My name is Rusty Allen, and I have killed mint. <laughs> it's possible to kill it. It is possible to kill it. You can have it in the wrong spot. But again, y'all probably know how it's going to travel underneath the ground, and it's going to come up in lots of spaces. If you do want one, get you one. Get spearmint. That's the cooking mint, and it's terrific. And then I put in oreganos, the Italian and the Greek oreganos. Spread the same way underneath the ground, not nearly as quickly. But Italian oregano is the one you're looking for for tomatoes, anything like that. It gets tall. It gets about two, two and a half feet high. Then it has tiny white flowers on it. A lot of tiny flowers, especially white, tend to bring lots of pollinating insects if you like that. If you don't want the height and you want it to be a little bit more mannerly, get you Greek. The Greek one trails a lot nicer and comes down over a rock and looks very good. Pair it with your trailing rosemary. So many cities, especially East Dallas, it seems like to me, and they discover that rosemary is an evergreen, heat-tolerant shrub that they can use in lots of places. Low, low, low maintenance. The trailing rosemary version will get you eh, maybe about a foot high, two to two and a half feet wide, coming over stone. And yes, you can use it for chicken. It's a great, great plant. And you probably should be used more. What I usually say when we're talking about herbs in a herb class, we would say most herbs are perennials in Texas, which is great but most of them really don't like our hot reflected heat. So it depends on how much heat on the southwest side or maybe on the west side of a home that you have in full sun. Most herbs do best with a half day of sun. Thyme is very, very tolerant. And one thing to say on thyme, if you're keeping it in a, especially a larger area and you're wanting to commit to it, thyme needs to be trimmed. Thyme gets woody with age and it will play out. You get bigger stems and fewer leaves and eventually it goes bleh and doesn't look so good. So you need to trim it from time to time and it looks better from time to time. Vines. I wanted to, to start concentrating a little bit more on using vines this way. And I, I will be honest with you, I'm a kind of a newbie when it comes to having a lot of experience of people growing vines on the ground. If you want to grow vines on the ground, you have to, again, be sure of, number one, that you want it. 
what I usually say when I'm talking to a customer about vines, when you think vines, you think maintenance. How much maintenance are you comfortable with? How big is your trellis? Do you want it to go across the lines to your neighbor's yard? Pick the right one. But when you're talking about these vines, and we have some caveats on some of these, and I bet you know several of them, of which ones might work for you. Star jasmine is a terrific one. It has those really nice smelling white flowers. It's very, very pretty. Probably in most situations, you want to give it in a half day of sun to do well. Cross vine, cross vine I brought. Here is my favorite. Dart has found it. Dallas, what is it? Dallas Area Rapid Transit and the trains that, and their train stations. They're using it a lot and it looks terrific. It's an evergreen, blooming, Texas native vine that still blooms in part sun. And it's just got so many wonderful points to it. But these old bricky orange yellow flowers with yellow throats, very, very pretty. And again, like many plants, because of magnesium, they're turning purple from the cold weather. And you get some nice purple coloration. It'll drop a few leaves, but overall, it's going to be evergreen and bloom. <coughs> very solidly in mid-spring, and here come the hummingbirds. And it's a terrific plant. Grow it on trellis, because I bet you're going to want to see it, but you could grow it in the ground. Japanese honeysuckle. There needs to be a phrase called, be sure you want it, on several of these plants. And here's another one, probably like maybe English ivy. But Japanese honeysuckle, Halls, Halls honeysuckles, Haleana, is probably one of the most common ones that you'll see around. And it's in improved quote-unquote version with some pretty purple leaves and that kind of coloration and of course the flowers that you're used to but it will spread everywhere passion vine y'all should know a lot about passion vine probably because of butterflies uh, mostly from the gulf fritillary uh, butterfly which loves that plant uh, i like it a lot it will grow on the ground you'll see actually the texas native version growing on the ground and then pipe vine Pipe vine brings the pipe vine caterpillar and butterfly, which is a beautiful blue, and it's wonderful. We get a lot of people asking for this for that reason. This is a plant, though, you want this particular one, which is Fimbriata, or you say, I'm looking for the pipe vine for my butterflies, because there are other kinds, and they don't like it. This is what you're looking for. Virginia creeper, this is the poor plant that gets the rap for being poison ivy all the time. I know. And it has five leaves. You see the quinquefolia right here? Five or more sometimes. I think you see different kinds of leaves on them, all separated. Not the leaves of three let it be thing and poison ivy. But again, be sure you want it. It's beautiful. My dad out in Fredericksburg has got it just native. He didn't plant it. It was just growing out there. And you'll see it climbing up a nice juniper tree and then it will turn burgundy and beautiful leaf colors in the fall. And then if it's old enough, it will have flowers and berries, which are great for birds. Incidentally, we should say these kinds of things. When you're working with a lot of these kinds of vines and plants and you're putting them in the landscape, they shouldn't be on a tree, really. There's a lot of plants that really shouldn't be on a tree. When you take something like Virginia creeper, I've seen plenty of trees long term do fine with Virginia creeper on it. It loses its leaves and it's okay. But the one ground cover that's not a ground cover anymore, and you see people growing it on trees, either by purpose or design, is English ivy. And English ivy is evergreen, and it holds air, it holds moisture, it holds dirt, it holds everything against the plant, and it's not a good idea. So be careful, make sure you're not having ground covers growing into a tree. And then trumpet vine. Talk about the be sure you want it plant. Um, we're still selling it, I do believe. People will say, why are you selling that plant? Because they know. And then other people will say, I want that beautiful vine uh, with the orange yellow flowers and brings hummingbirds like crazy, and that's terrific. But I have a friend who had it on one side of the driveway, and it came up on the other side of the driveway. This is in that golden bamboo category. Yes, be sure you want it, plant. A little bit of lawn alternatives. Uh, Mexican feather grass, I have a little guy here. Very popular, getting very nicely popular around. It will seed out for you, especially if you have gravel 
like decompose granite nearby, you'll get more of it, which is terrific. If not, use some different kinds of mulch that's there, not gravel. Use probably an organic mulch like a cedar or something else. Horsetail reed we mentioned earlier is another good choice, and you could mow it down. The sedges, of course. The blue gramma, the little blue stem, and buffalo grasses. These are heading toward the Texas native and the native to prairies grasses that are excellent choices to grow as a lawn alternative. Now remember, not all of these are going to be turf. They're not going to be growing straight across and low. They may be tall, like little blue stem. But I did a couple little notes here for you. Buffalo grass grows in full sun. Dead stop. You can't have part shade like you have your San Augustine and grow buffalo. Don't let someone try to sell you on it. It will be patchy, it will never fill in, and won't look good, and you'll hate me. Buffalo grass has to be in full sun. You can mix it with blue grandma and curly mesquite, which is called thunder turf, from Native American seed, and you can buy it in seed. And I have a couple of seed mixes uh, to show you here. Thunder turf is not uh, available in stock right now for us, but we'll have it back in. And you can get a seed mix. This is another good way to establish some ground covers, especially if you're blessed with real estate and you have some area that you want to cover. Let me suggest some Texas natives to do that for you. And there's one. There's one mix that has 30 plus grasses and flowers in it. Well, you could say it is possible to get rid of Bermuda. It is possible to kill mint. I've done that. But it is possible to get rid of Bermuda if you have it. It's much easier to get rid of St. Augustine. If you're trying to get rid of the maintenance and the water part of it, and you do have an appreciable amount of sun, not like no sun, there are Texas natives that grow in seeds, or available in seed, that would be good choices for you. And we can help you out with that, absolutely. I say seed because maybe you don't want to go buy 450 flats of Mondo and plant them all. Now, there's a couple of things like some of the Mondos, the Liriope to a certain degree, um, and maybe some of the ones we saw earlier that you can. When we're getting into uh, landscape alternatives or lawn alternatives here, we need to figure out, are you going to try to replace the turf and you want something low, or will something taller be acceptable? And that's what you'll need to know so it will drive you to the right plant. You've got some shade alternatives, not as many. I will say that from what I've learned about plants, and especially this kind of category, that most of them grow in half day, half day best. You get more choices that way. They're ground covers. <laughs> if you're a ground cover and you want to be out in full hot sun, totally bare, doesn't make much sense, does it? You want these plants to be, have a little bit of these small leaves underneath other trees and things so they can appreciate some of the shade. But yes, you can find some choices. I like this shot because it shows you Little Bunny, that grass that you're seeing there is called Little Bunny, and combined with some evergreens and some deciduous plants that lose their leaves and a really big pot, metal edging, but no lawn. No lawn. Here's your other choices. I want you to know <laughs> if you don't want to take anything else from this presentation and you give up, <laughs> you don't know what else to do, it may be mulch. It may just go ahead and be mulch. And that's good. That's fine. There are several choices. I have pine straw, pecan shell, hardwood, pine bark, cedar, these kinds of mulches. And there's other choices. These are all what we call organic mulches because they were ground up trees or something. And they're good choices for you. Again, probably a combination of hardscaping mulches and plants. Hardscaping, the, pa the pavers, the gravel, decking, stepping stones, maybe a combination <coughs> will work and looks right. Plastic. Plastic of putting down a sheet of heavy plastic and then putting plants in the holes or gravel, I'm not going to recommend to you. The plastic does break down. You may change your mind and you want something else there, and it's a nightmare. And it's not needed. When you plant things properly and you mulch properly with the right type of mulch, don't worry about the weeds. Moving a lot of heavy gravel when you've changed your mind. Mm -mm. Then there's this final choice. Let it go, let it go. I have a couple of friends that live out in the country 
And they don't, they have a lot of space. And they just let grow what's there. And a lot of times, it's gonna be chickweed, it's gonna be some low-growing Texas native grasses, it's, you're nodding your head, it's going to have maybe some frog fruit, and all these different kinds of plants together. And you can mow it, and it does work. It's what we call a diverse lawn, and it's another choice. And it's possible. Here's a shot of Silver Falls Dichondra. And down the bottom, isn't that pretty? Little bachelor button celosia. It was kind of nice because it was up close. And then the horsetail reed and gravel. Other choices, features, path stacking, maybe a vegetable herb garden, something like that could be your choice. Pull up the lawn, put a vegetable garden in its place. Maybe an entertaining area. I'm putting in a dry creek soon. I love dry creeks. It's a great solution to a low drainage issue. Works very well. Pond or a pool, pretty neat. No grass, small yard, but almost zero maintenance. I think those are nice examples of that. Here's some nice Asian jasmine in the corner. All right, quickly we're gonna go over soil preparation and planting, and that's in your little handout there. Check the coverage rates, right plant, right place, yes? Cultivate the area, don't do any heavy tilling, especially if you have tree roots nearby. Remember those trees are probably your big landscape value. We don't wanna damage the roots underneath. Remove every weed. Every one of them, every single weed. Here's a method that works sometimes too if you're starting a new area. Go ahead and cultivate it if you have the benefit of time and it's not gonna be spring. Go ahead and cultivate it, do your thing, water it. Pull all the weeds that you can see, water it, and then see what comes up over the next seven to 10 days, two weeks, and then pull those. And if you have the benefit of time, it works well. And then you get a little bit more certain of you got them all. Add compost. Organic compost is what I'm going to recommend to you. At least two to three inches. Expanded shale. Everyone in this room should nod in agreement. They know what expanded shale is, right? She's shaking her head. Uh-oh. Okay. Well, expanded shale is a miracle for the soil. What you need to know is it's giving us drainage. Most of you live in this area somewhere along the line. You've got Blackland Prairie clay soil. The Blackland Prairie is a wonderful thing. There's not much of it left but we do have the soil left, and it doesn't drain, right? It's hard, it's thick, it's cold. Expanded shale puts air back in the soil, and that's what you're gonna need. One to two inches, maybe more, especially if the drainage is poor, or if you're gonna tell me, oh my gosh, I really would like to do some agaves and succulents and sedums and things that need good drainage. Add your fertilizer, a starter fertilizer would be terrific. This is Espoma's Biotome Starter Plus. Think of it as a dry soil starter. This is an excellent product. The tone part of these names is bacteria. We do know that bacteria is the reason why the earthworms follow and plants grow. And I have a sample for all of y'all outside to take home. Try it for sure. Turn it, turn everything in. People say, you just put an inch on top and leave it. I said, no, you, I know, sounds silly. You do turn the whole thing. Water it, soak it, take your plants, Get you some root stimulator if you don't have any. Make you a bucket. Dip the plant in it. Let it soak for a minute. Get you another glass of wine. And then go plant. And if you have 450 of these, you have 450 of these today, which is great. And then mulch. Mulch, mulch, mulch. We say it's our mantra. Three to four inches at the very least. Maintenance on sometimes, some of these plants, you're going to need to trim sometimes. Mowing, check. Liriopes, Mondos, once a year, a lot of times around now, middle of February, as soon as it warms up in between, it gets cold again, do that. Fertilizing, I use Texas tea, um, which is a lawn fertilizer, which is terrific. You can use other kinds too, or maybe a spray in case it's a big area. <coughs> Winter protection, you're going to need some frost cloth or something maybe, especially if you're planting right now, a brand new plant might want some protection. And then the weeding. The whole reason most of you will say, I want a ground cover area as a solution to the landscape, not so much less maintenance, is because they don't want to be pulling weeds or anything. They don't want to water. So don't add to your burden by having weeds in it. You can't use herbicides because in most of these instances, your ground cover is near another plant that you want. 
you can use a pre-emergent, which you may be hearing a lot talk about right now in the February. A pre-emergent will get you those annual weeds that may sprout up from seed in your ground cover. But be careful with any kind of herbicide, especially if your plants are brand new and you haven't had them in a while. And then check that mulch. Check it, check it, check it. NHG.com is our website. And people ask me, do you have a list of all your classes and workshops and things that's going on? Yes, we do. And we have so many, it has to be on our website. And there's a whole bunch more there for you. Um, a lot of people ask me for our handouts. We have lots of different kinds of handouts, uh, from rose lists to, uh, oh my gosh, I'm going to try to think of some more. Ones on azaleas and different kinds of plants that you might want. And they're PDFs online. That's it.